I'm pleased and honored to be moderating this first panel of this gathering, of this conference. Um, and we've been having a really great uh, email conversation with most of these people over the last week or so, which, um, you know, if we could just turn that into a conversation, we would have we would have already done our panel, but we haven't met in person um, until right now. So that's uh, that's kind of great. And uh, so we've got we've done a bit of planning and we're going to wing it a bit. So I'm going to tell you and my panelists what we're going to do just to remind us um, if it's all right with you guys. I'm going to just say a very brief introduction and then I'm going to really briefly introduce you one by one to talk for about five minutes in response to our questions and then we're going to give other people a chance to have some input. Does that sound right? And I'm going to, when I introduce you, I'm not going to read your whole long bios from the program because I don't want to take up all the time doing that and everybody else can go to the program and read them and then meet each other and find out more about each other in person. So, um, all right. So, yeah, as I say, we've had some really great uh, email back and forth around the, the topic and questions that we were given for this panel and um, did a little bit of playing around with the topic and questioning the words and um, bringing up all sorts of complexities and uh, different angles on it. Um, and out of that, a couple of things that I think we could sort of say and agree to came out of it. One being that uh, many artists, and including musicians, have been um, inter interdisciplinary in spirit or doing something that one might call inter-arts practice for a really long time. It's not a new thing. Um, that's number one. And number two, this practice of inter-arts or inter interdisciplinarity has been on the rise in all disciplines, including music, in recent years. Um, and we've bandied about various reasons and motivations for this and also raised various questions and challenges um, and concerns and enthusiasms around that, around, around that, um, that thing, that, that phenomenon. Um, and it also, also in the panel I'm going to be on later, the same thing was happening, that you discover that everybody's, not everybody's, not only everybody's views, but everybody's use of and response to the terms and words that we put forward um, vary quite a bit. Some people like the words, some people want to change them, some people suggest other terms, um, due to all our differing practices and perspectives. And so, um, here we are at this gathering, which brings us all together for four days from all over the country, uh, all over the world, I think, and um, we're placing at the center of these four days the notion of something we're calling inter-arts or interdisciplinarity, interdisciplinary practice as it relates to music. And um, so we're going to start, kick off with this session, inviting uh, all the complexity and some of the controversy that this might entail by asking what does this notion of inter-arts mean to you and your work? And um, why is it important? What in is, it, is it important to talk about? So um, I guess we'll just go as where we're sitting. And so um, this is William Robinson. He's a multidisciplinary artist from who studied in Halifax and is now studying at New Brunswick, New Jersey, which is a place I just learned exists. Um, he creates. It's true. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, he creates installations that combine sculpture, sound, video, performance, musical composition, and printed matter. And uh, here you go, William. Oh. All right, I'm going to go quick. Uh, hey, everyone, thank you so much. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so as Ruth said, I, um, I went to Natskat University where I did my BFA, but I remember going to 
a school event, event dance and seeing a bunch of older students playing in a band and soon realized that I actually wanted to play in a band more than um, go to class and learn about visual art. So I think that was kind of the beginning of me thinking about the collision between visual modes and auditory modes and music. And then soon, soon learning about practices um, such as Yoko Ono, uh, Cage, obviously, uh, Oliveris, who I got to see Norm Adams brought to Halifax. Um, I think it was in the early 2000s, which was really profound for me to see. Um, yeah, and um, my upbringing, my mother is a kindergarten teacher who's very musical, and my father's an urban planner, so um, there's, he worked at home and there's lots of topographical maps uh, in his office that I would look at with intent and ingest, and so from an early age, um, just kind of like would work between visual learning and musical learning, and uh, both my grandfathers were ministers in the Anglican Church, so going to church, um, it's, it's a space that encompasses music, performance, costume, uh, visual modes, and uh, yeah, I think um, playing in bands in, in university and, uh, and just being really interested in, in uh, graphical composition, I, slowly amalgamated these two mediums and um, started working with uh, professional composers in, in translating these graphical compositions into, into music and working with uh, public site, uh, thinking about how one can interact with public site or a specific building in, in an auditory way, interpreting that site into music. Um, yeah, so that's kind of what I've been working in uh, over the past five years, and um, yeah, just have a hard time differentiating between, like, uh, being in, in grad school right now, um, yeah, it's very ocular-centric, so it's, it's hard. It's not hard, it's just kind of the the discussion is always kind of filtered through this visual framework. And so even though the program I'm in at Rutgers is very kind of um, presumes to be multidisciplinary, it's still obviously like a very visual kind of way of thinking. So um, yeah. Um, and. I've just heard recently through the email discussions that um, the Canada Council now is, they're not being so specific in grant application divisions. I don't know how true that is, maybe I'm wrong. Which is a, a good thing good thing to hear in terms of someone that is a multidisciplinary artist that is you know, not interested in presenting one medium over the other. Um, yeah, so there we go. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll just take it back yeah. for a minute. And um, next we have Isabella Stefanescu, who's an interdisciplinary artist, director, producer, and creator or co-creator of the Euphona Pen, which I think I experienced last year at a conference. Anyway, a wonderful thing. Um, and she's based in Kitchener Waterloo. Kitch Kitchener Waterloo. So um, the original uh, question for this panel was, why is uh, contemporary yeah, music uh, uh, so welcoming to interarts practice? And uh, in this email exchange that we have, the first one who had a statement was Sandy. He really knew precisely uh, why <laughs> that is, <laughs> why why it's happening. And I shall let you uh, let him tell you all about it. 
Uh, in my case, one simple answer is that, in fact, the new music community is actually very welcoming. Um, I find myself slightly surprised each time I have to present in a new music context, because I come from a visual arts background. I actually spent my school years as a kid who was kicked out of choir for not having had any musical ability whatsoever. So uh, being here and being welcomed and being able to talk to a, to a gathering like this is actually being one of the reasons why the arts practice is on the rise in this community. The thing that interests me a lot about the rise of in the arts practice is the personal motivations of people. Um, each one of us probably comes from some kind of country of origin, uh, a native practice, so to speak. Uh, we started out as instrumentalists, some people, some, some kind of musician, visual arts, writers. But at some point, we found ourselves crossing the boundaries and starting to, uh, to do things in other, for lack of a better word, disciplines. And uh, what I would like to find out in this next four days in this kind of a discussion is why did that happen? Why did it happen for you individually? What was lacking in your uh, practice of origin that drove you to interact practice? And there are some people who didn't cross. Why didn't you? Why do you think it's important to actually stay where you are in your, in your home territory? So as we know, uh, interact practice is on the rise in all, in all artistic uh, disciplines to the extent that uh, the boundaries are blurring somewhat. So what I would also very much like to discuss in the next four days is what happens when you actually do go from your practice into a new one where you become a beginner. Um, what happens when you're a beginner in a new practice to your original practice? Where you're actually spending less time? For those of us who work with our bodies, what happens to that embodied knowledge? Because we actually are not spending as much time as, um, as we used to. So uh, the other thing that I would very much uh, uh, like to know in the next uh, few days that the kind of uh, conversations we might have um, is uh, what are the political implications of this kind of artistic metissage? What does it really mean uh, to the way we practice our art? And then the importance of finding out whether inter arts practice is a practice. In other words, uh, whether it's a when you bring two forms of art together, are you putting them beside each other, or is it a new form of expression? So uh, I'll pass the mic. Thank, Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Lots of great questions. And um, if we just keep gathering questions through this session, I think that's, that's really productive. Um, and uh, Elke El Moltracht? who um, I'm just meeting now for the first time, uh, is a musicologist, curator, and initiator of international and interdisciplinary festivals and programs that link forms of music through uncommon thematic associations. And she raised in her email, and she can talk more about it, but it is sort of an interesting question related to um, politics and global issues. So that was a good lead in to um, passing it to you. First of all, thanks for invi inviting me to um, Quebec again after some years. So um, I started my curatorial work in the 90s, um, and in the late 90s, it was this fascinosum of the 
first laptop generation. And I was totally influenced in that and collaborated a lot with audiovisual artists in that field um, in a center for contemporary arts which worked in departments. Um, in theater, music, film, etc. And then I entered the Academy of the Arts of the World and uh, understand one additional aspect quite well and I'm really um, um, impressed of it and would like to discuss together with you some of those points I found out. So this academy has no boundaries between the departments and uh, we have all arts and I saw that just the contemporary music is the one who is not maybe really willing to deal with political questions and I don't mean political correctness and I don't mean platitudes of political questions. I mean really um, questions that could be discussed like one example, uh, we are doing a project botanical gardens and colonialism. It is a lot of politics, but it has nothing to do with the political correctness of the news or those things. And why not? And that is a point uh, that goes to funding institutions as well as to festival directors. Why not to um, change thinking of how to commission a work? When I, for instance, uh, not just say, do a new piece for me for a string quartet or for an orchestra, but I have a content like this botanical garden, whatever, and I start to talk with the composer, with the, com uh, with the ensemble, festival director, etc., to find out how um, this commission could look like or how, how, how an application could look like. And then I come also to one point. You mentioned already this changing of um, funding structures. As a next point, what is related to is, uh, it is the institution structure should make change. So when we stop thinking in separate departments, working together with artists from different uh, views, this I see at the academy, that it is of course a difference uh, if a contemporary artist looks to music or vice versa. And uh, Persons in institutions have to, may be influenced also by other cultures. That is the next aspect. And when I like to discuss these political issues, then we are really in the center of interdisciplinarity. I will come. Okay, there it is. <laughs> um, um, so this is Gauguin. Uh, and they're a transdisciplinary artist interested in relational practices between human beings, ecologies, and technologies. And their practice embraces media arts, land art, installation, and video dance, and other th interesting things if you read more or ask more. Here you go, Goljan. Thank you. Um, I'm also really grateful to be here. Um, I was quite surprised to be invited because I, I insisted a lot to say, but I'm not a musician. This is the one thing I'm not doing. <laughs> but now I understand so much more that it's about transdisciplinary and I'm so glad to talk about this. Um, maybe I would like to start also by saying that maybe somewhere in the program you, you saw that this panel should host someone called Anne Goldenberg and this is Goldian, so that's the same person. Uh, and actually that's the, uh, leftovers of, of a time where I really separated my academic life and my artistic life. So I, I, I'm, I had this other name and I really didn't want the academic world to know what I was doing. Because I was doing arts in a hidden way. I was sociologist, anthropologist, and communication researcher. But I didn't want, I, I didn't know how to do the, the crossing. Until when I was finishing my PhD, well, I already had started to do installation to, to talk about, I was studying wikis, and then I heard about this project called Dance Your PhD, and I did a dance of my PhD. Well, actually, I didn't dance much. I was playing myself like a researcher, and I brought geeks, like computer programmers, and my friend from France, where I come from, to dance what they understood of my PhD, but also the programmer to dance what it is to make a program because they were the specialists. And it was a lot of fun. We did everything in a week and it worked like it win the social science category. So I was like, wow. 
Um, that was much more pleasant than these six years of PhD. And much more interesting. <laughs> um, and um, that, was, that was a start. And I realized that I also really enjoy um, the practice of translation, or maybe uh, bringing people to translate um, what they understood or what they felt. Um, I also have a practice of facilitation, so maybe I can see myself as a facilitator of, of translation. And I started to do that. Like, I, I, I've been studying technology a lot, so I ask uh, my dancer friend to dance common lines, uh, and then command lines, and then um, um, musicians who interpret uh, them also, and uh, bringing most of the time non-experts to do something about something else. Um, and yeah, I really enjoyed that, but at the same time, I was very often meeting artists who would ask me, so what are you doing? And I was like, yeah, this and this and this. And they would say, oh, you're really dispersed. Or you're really uh, spraying too thin, like you want to like. And I was really believing that. Um, and at some point, uh, for some reason that also surprised me, uh, I was asked to help the RAIC, which is the Regroupement des Arts Interdisciplinaires du Québec. And I was, I was asked to help them to look at the programming. And that was a click for me. I was already doing some workshop with them. And and I understood what inter interdisciplinary or anti-disciplinary, they also say that, practice is. And it's much more about following your path. Uh, and, and then discipline doesn't really matter. It's like, what do you want to talk about? And maybe I could end with saying that um, for me now, the path become very important, the way we do things. Um, and I read a, a beautiful sentence by Tish Nathan who say, the path, the path, or the yeah, the path is the goal, uh, and I think this is my philosophy now. Like, so if the path is good, then the the result or the goal will be beautiful. So, yeah. Uh, there we go. All right. Can you go long enough? Uh, it's long enough, and. Um, Last at the, on our line of chairs, but not at all least, is uh, Sandeep Bhagwati, who is a composer, researcher, poet, theater maker, installation artist, and conductor, born in India, a citizen of Germany, and now living in Montreal. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's inter already. <laughs> Thanks for, um, for having me here. It's, it's a great pleasure to be in this room with all the people, so many of whom I know, and uh, it's great to reconnect. Um, and uh, yeah, I wanted to, I have two points that I, that I wanted to speak about. Uh, Isabella has said that I already knew all the answers. That's not true, I just answered the question about technology. And so what, how does changing technology uh, mm -hmm. affect inter-arts? And my answer was very simply, um, 20 years ago or 30 years ago, doing inter-arts was very complicated and costly because you had to hire people to do things that you couldn't do yourself. Technology has made it so much easier to, to just, anyone can create a video, and can crea anyone can create a soundscape. Um, so you don't need the actual help, you just need, of course, the artistic insights. But they, these were always cheap in the sense and that they couldn't be charged, you know, that they, they wouldn't charge you anything for that. So um, what I, uh, what I meant in this was that today the question is not why inter-arts, but more why not inter-arts, because it's possible. Um, and this links into a longer story of where I think that um, inter-arts projects are really uh, not the exception but the rule. And if you look at world history, that world cultures and at all the religions were, you know, are really good at creating sensorial experiences for their followers. They always use all the senses, not one of them. Uh, even smell and, and you know, space and everything. So um, these kind of experiences were sort of primal. And at some point, Western modernism decided that they had to be separated. And since then, we have this trouble of interdisciplinarity in the arts which doesn't really mean anything to somebody who is doing 
parts. I always like to quote, I've quoted him several days now again, um, Ezra Pound who says, if you want to if you want to understand or be an artist, go to the roots of the art, not to the leaves of the art. So mm -hmm. um, in, that, in that sense, uh, for me, being at the roots doesn't have any discipline at all. And this links to the second point that I wanted to make. Uh, discipline anyway is something you need to learn something. It's a pedagogical term. Uh, but we're all out of school, many of us, for many years. So why would it be important to us to cling to a discipline? So these are the two open questions that I have. Um, I founded in 2006, I came to Canada in 2006 to found um, a lab at Concordia University called Matra Lab. And um, I had a chair called Chair for Inter, no, I was hired to a chair called Chair for Interdisciplinary Art, which I quickly changed because at of this thing that we're not in, in school in a sense, when you're doing research, we're not in school anymore. Um, so I wanted it to be named Inter-X Art because I found that people who do interdisciplinary art also often do interactive art or intermodal art or intercultural art or intertraditional inter art or any other kind of inter-art because being inter-things is something that's like a virus. Once you do it in one thing, you do it in all the other things very soon too. And so I didn't want the lab to be uh, limited in that way. Um, and I just want to mention briefly one project that we're currently doing, which I find very uh, challenging and interesting in inter-arts. That is, we have a project where we cr try to create music by interviewing artists who have a very string strong discipline that has nothing to do with performance or time, like a sculptor or a poet or a photographer or something like that. Yeah. And we try to, in interviews with them, we try to extract their process of how a work is being created, which is very different from what many composers or musicians think they do when they create art, and try then to create a musical piece in that process, through that particular process of that of a particular artwork. Um, uh, so. The poet doesn't get to write a poem, in a sense. They sort of give us their seeds, and we grow a new plant in music from them. And I like that. Uh, it's very challenging. It's, it's not easy to even um, understand how things work in that, but that's precisely the condition that, we, that I think everybody who works in interarts really likes when you have no idea what you're doing, and then you just do it. I can talk loud. Do I need a microphone if I can talk yeah, loud? Because yeah. uh, you're recording it, right? Let's just it. Well, I can just, just <laughs> free the microphone. <laughs> it's hidden okay. behind there. Okay. <laughs> so you can pass it back and forth, mm -hmm. or you can. And do people need a microphone if they're responding? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so we do. And what I mean is, if you people say something, do they need to be on a microphone? You need to pass a microphone around the audience. Well, we can come up to the front. <laughs> is it important for your recording of it to be that? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Is Mary in the I just repeat the question. Okay, I'll repeat the question. Very good. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. I sorry. Is it being recorded? Is that like I just just wanna? It's going to Facebook Live. Okay. So it's so kind of important that it gets sent. <laughs> yes. Okay. I'm just going to. Sorry, there's no time to sort all out this before. This all out before. It's all just one last year. How much time did you say we have? <laughs> so all inter arts, interdisciplinary performance, doing things you're not very good at, right? Yes. Like, uh, for me. <laughs> like dealing with microphones. <laughs> um, how much time did you just say again? <laughs> Ten, minutes. Ten minutes. Okay. Well, um, I was thinking I we can people could ask questions of our panelists, or we could also just ask questions as it's the start of the conference. In other words, I think we could ask questions that don't necessarily have to be, probably can't be answered in this panel. So I might just say, from what we've heard everyone talk about, are there questions that have come up on your mind or sort of, yeah, kind of things that it, issues have come up that you'd like to, or, or anything else that you want to add to it to put into the pot of this conversation and questions? Yeah. Hi, I'm Bud. Want to come up? Is that why not? Sure. Um, since people are, are sharing, I just uh, 
one thing I was interested about, interested in asking people, or or maybe something that they think about or might want to think about is uh, is uh, where they're working in a city or a small town. And the reason I'm thinking of that is because um, I started my career as an arts journalist in a small city, Kingston, and. Um, I interviewed all kinds of different artists. Some of them were famous coming through town. Some of them were people that weren't known outside of Kingston. I talked to visual, I, I, I studied music, um, but I interviewed visual artists. And I knew nothing about visual mm -hmm. art. And, um, and it was a really interesting life for four years. Um, uh, any type of artistic discipline you can think of. Um, I interviewed somebody for the local paper. When I moved to Toronto, um, I almost exclusively was uh, writing about music. I worked for a music publication and all my freelance work was music and it's kind of what I wanted to do but I really missed that and so in my mind I always thought it was because I was living in a smaller city and so there wasn't as much going on. So um, it's not an answer, it's just sort of a question for me whether that is an effect on, on the artists. Whether, whether it's where where it's happening, it's happening makes a difference to what it is or how we think about it. So I think this is good. Does anyone else want to come up and add something to the what is this thing we're talking about and why do we want to talk about it, broadly speaking? Yeah, I'd like to react. Uh, my name is Cleo Palacio Quintin. I'm a flutist and composer from Montreal. And uh, yeah, the first thing I'd like to react on and also sort of answer and ask more question about. Uh, Elke asked uh, what brought, uh, brought us to cross the boundaries of our disciplines. And actually what I feel like to me is that I actually, as a creative artist, there's no disciplines in my mind. <laughs> so when I'm creative, I don't think in just a musical way. And for me, it's actually, I've been trained as a musician, but Earlier, I was more interested into graphic arts and painting, and and then I ended up now doing multidisciplinary works where I also do lots of uh, electronics and programming, and so my my creative ideas for me are not linked directly to one discipline; it, they can expand in many direction, I would say, and so I feel like it's not the yeah we we're trained in one discipline, but our mind doesn't work in only one. So for me it comes from, it's not that we've been crossing the discipline, it's that we are creative first and then the school forces us to choose a, a discipline, but we're not necessarily, yeah, it's not enough, so we need more space <laughs> and to be able to expand in different ways. Uh, there is a big um, difference between artists, right? They are working like you uh, described, uh, and institutions. In institutions and in funding uh, programs, you have the splitting, and that is what I mean. So, uh, also in, in um, uh, House of the uh, Cultures of the World or Academy in Berlin, uh, they have all these departments. Of course, each department is working also interdisciplinary. But uh, when a curator is sitting on the contemporary arts uh, department, another one in the performing arts department, it's not um, always the case that they collaborate to each other. And that I mean uh, this academy in Cologne was built uh, from the beginning without any, any department. So we have all kinds of art forms. And um, the result is when artists from different art fields working together, curators or art directors, then the program looks different because it is a permanent dialogue. What we do, as, as an, I'm not a musician, I'm an organizer, curator. So when one sits together from the beginning with uh, representatives from different arts or cultures, then the program becomes a different view. And the artists uh, are the fastest. They use what you said. They use everything what they like. I want to address this question too, uh, partially because I came from purely a, a visual arts practice and then I crossed over into music, um, thinking about time, how, how time is part of a, a visual arts. What I found is I created something in order to be able to perform drawings. And quite often, I, uh, musicians have played with the toy I created 
and they, the first thing they do is try to use it as a musical instrument. So, so there, I realize then how, how rooted they are in the practice they started from. And it is for them quite an effort to think of the evolutions of marking time, which is drawing, versus the evolutions of sound in time, which is music. So it's, it's really kind of, um, it's, it requires an effort to cross the boundary. Um, yeah, I don't want to dominate this as the moderator, but I'm just dying to say something um, that's, 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 that I've been thinking about since I've been since we've been talking about it, it's actually since all the email conversations, and um, but and maybe it'll spark some other thoughts and questions a bit of time we have left. But Sandy, when you say, you said that you say that yeah, the technology um, prevents us before we had to hire someone to do things that we couldn't do ourselves, and I just find that so interesting because. Um, well, there's sort of, I guess what I'm realizing and with people, there's a sort of interdisciplinary inter-arts work, which is one person working in different disciplines and going where we want to as an artist, and there's a kind of interdisciplinary work that's about collaboration, and obviously there's a lot of overlap. And um, the other thing is that disciplines aren't all, I, I've come out of the discipline of theater to start out with, which really is whatever else, it, it's an interdisciplinary pla practice and it's a collaborative practice, so I think our starting points might make a difference for how we're seeing that, but also, so for me, like, there's a lot of there's some things I'm good at, and there's an awful lot of things I'm not good at. And so when I'm when I'm doing interdisciplinary work, I mean I'm not. It's it's about hiring the people and mixing them together as well. So I just it's uh, just mulling that over, including technology. I'm no good at technology, so to work with technology also involves hiring someone. So I don't know if the technology. I guess I just don't know if it's always if it, is it always meaning work on your own or just yeah. Um, <coughs> sorry. Um, just to clarify, if you're working in a theater production and you wanted an audiovisual image, before the advent of high resolution video, you would have to have to film it weeks ahead. You have to have to, would have had to plan it out. You would have to budget it with an entire film crew and so on with lights and so on. Yeah. Uh, that has disappeared. Yeah. You don't need that anymore. And that makes it so much cheaper and easier and faster. Yeah. And it's this precise, this, this accessibility, this fastness, this, <laughs> this ease in integrating it into a, a natural workflow. That is, has changed and that, that has made it easier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, this is true and I know that. I guess my question is just where and when, what are the parameters now about hiring people? When do we do it and why do we do it in the midst of that? And um, Time for maybe one or two more Could I just, responses. I was yeah. just going to say, um, the first question was about place influencing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want to say in Halifax, coming out of uh, doing my undergrad at NASCAP, that um, there weren't a lot of gallery-related opportunities for young artists, but there was a lot of public art funding uh, related to intervening with a specific public site. So that really propelled mm -hmm. my practice and thinking about site and building um, in terms of both visual and auditory mm -hmm. interventions. So um, Halifax definitely has kind of shaped my practice in that regard. Um, I, maybe I, would, I, wa I wanted to uh, come again on the question of hiring people and or not. Or collaborating. Or collaborating, yeah. Um, I think that's a that's a big question. Uh, Sometimes collaborating feels like a jam and every everyone enjoys, so that's the money we get, kind of, just like. But um, yeah, sometimes it's real work, and it happened to me that collaboration uh, got paid afterward, and then I felt really bad to, to receive the money, so I was like, okay, uh, that was a collaboration, how do I share that, give recognition, and um, I've been in a workshop, we organize a workshop about collaborative practices. And in this workshop, we, we reflect on when is it that an idea seems to be personal, collective? When is it that it feels like work? When, when is it playfulness? And there is no answer to that. But I think uh, this idea of collaborating cross-discipline brings um, yeah question of recognition when it's 
it's not settled, yeah. 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 Well, we'll set a time, which we'll any um, comments? No, I, I think I've offered all my comments, but um, I, I, so we, is there time for, if there's any, there's one more person dying to say something out there. Any of, <laughs> any of my fellow panelists want to take the last few seconds? I, I mean, I guess my, that's what you said about collaboration. We have four my, more days. Have four we've more got days. four more days. Basically, oh sorry, someone had a hand up there. Is it, did I see that? Okay, as she's, as she's coming, just gonna say, I think what Sandra said, right, I mean, we're bringing up complexities and questions and that's, we've got four more days to ask more of them. And uh, so that's a good way to start here. Um, my name is Louise, for those of you who don't know me. Um, I have come to realize in the last few years that almost all of my creative practice is collaborative um, and has been for ever since I was like this high. Um, it's funny because I find that for, for myself, when collaborations work well, it's because our creative processes have similarities. So if I'm working with somebody who has a collaborative kind of way of sharing, then it tends to go pretty easily. Whereas some people have very a much more personal solitary kinds of practices. And things can get a little bit rocky mm -hmm. at times with that. So I'm just wondering if, if anybody else finds that there's a process-related thing. Because if, you know, I, I learned how to improvise and compose through dance, not through music, mm -hmm. even though I'm a musician. So I collaborate really easily with dancers. Sometimes it can be trickier with other people who have different kinds of processes. So I'm just wondering if anybody else has that same experience. So we're going to take that wondering into our minds and into the rest of the conference is a good way to end, is thinking of our own preferences and practices and how these questions relate to it. So thank you, and thank everybody here. Thanks for